Hey guys, so this is part two of the respiration video series. In this one, we will cover pyruvate oxidation. We will talk about the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. And then finally, the synthesis of ATP. So let's refresh our memories. We know that the process of cellular respiration starts with glycolysis. And we know that the model that we use for glycolysis is glucose, which is a six-carbon sugar. Through a series of ten individual reactions, all of which are controlled by enzymes, we take that glucose molecule and we break it down into two molecules of a three-carbon compound called pyruvate or pyruvic acid. But seeing as how we have two molecules of that same three-carbon co compound, we could obviously get more energy from that. We know that glycolysis only yielded two real molecules of ATP, which is not enough to fuel an entire moving and living organism. So in glycolysis, <clears throat> glucose is only halfway oxidized. When it becomes pyruvate, we still have three carbons that we could oxidize and potentially get some energy from. Remember, glycolysis happens in the cytosol, because it's an anaerobic process, no oxygen. Now, once we have pyruvate, depending on the environmental conditions of your body, which means if oxygen is present or if oxygen isn't present, one of two things happens. If there is oxygen, pyruvate is going to enter the mitochondria and go through oxidation of pyruvate, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. If there isn't any oxygen... Yeah, if there isn't any oxygen present, then we're going to go through and do glycolysis so that we can recycle our electron carriers in the form of NADH. Now, only one of those fermentation steps could be not a, could be considered not a dead end. If we're doing alcohol fermentation, that's definitely a dead end. We're not making any energy, and we don't ever get we can't ever take the alcohol and convert it back into anything useful. But if we go through lactic acid fermentation or pr the production of lactate, like your muscles do after you've run a really long race or while you're running a really long race, then we still get to recycle our electron carrier, but your body can convert lactate back into pyruvate. So that's not a dead end. All right, so cellular respiration is always synonymous with the mitochondrion. So let's go through and talk about some of the structural features that allow the mitochondria to be a good site of cellular respiration. You know it's a double membrane organelle. So it has an outer membrane, which is smooth, and an inner membrane, which is folded. Those folds are called cristae. Between the inner and the outer membrane, there is an intermembrane space. So let's go through. This part's the outer membrane. All these folded regions are made up of the inner membrane, and each fold is called a cristae. Between your outer membrane and your folded inner membrane is a space. That space is called the intermembrane space. And it's not, it's not a, like a, an air pocket, it's fluid filled. As a matter of fact, the entire mitochondria is filled with a fluid called the matrix. Remember, mitochondria have their own DNA, their own ribosomes, and their own enzymes, which supports the theory of endosymbiosis, that the ancient relative or ancestor, if you will, of this mitochondrion was once a free-living prokaryotic cell of its own, capable of fulfilling its own needs. So, if you look at this picture right here, you realize that what real mitochondria look like aren't really like the cartoon versions that you always see in books or on videos, but you can still clearly see where it's folded. Now those folds are always are there just for the mere purpose of increasing surface area. You want your mitochondria to have as much surface area as possible so that you can fit all of these proteins in. The more proteins you have, the more efficient and successful you will be at producing ATP at the end of the entire process. If the inner membrane wasn't as highly folded and looked exactly like the outer membrane, we wouldn't have as many proteins in a mitochondria. Now, 
these guys, this is what they look like when they're dividing. They look just like bacteria or prokaryotes for the most part when they divide. They're going through binary fission right here. They're just making a cell plate, splitting in themselves in half, and then developing two individual cells. So again, this supports our theory of endosymbiosis. All right, so as soon as pyruvate enters the mitochondria, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to oxidize it. Now you have to remember that from here on out, everything we're talking about is happening, excuse me, in multiples of two because glycolysis produces two pyruvates. So pyruvate oxidation is a three-step process. In one of the steps, we're going to take one of those carbons off of pyruvate, and that becomes carbon dioxide, which your body will breathe out or exhale. And the other two carbon molecules form a sugar called acetyl. We're going to add a compound called coenzyme A to that to make it acetyl coenzyme A. Along the way, we're also going to make, sorry, two molecule, well, in, sorry, for every turn, we're going to make one molecule of the electron carrier NADH. So this happens twice. So ultimately, from the oxidation of pyruvate, we end up with two NADHs, two acetyl-CoA's, and then two molecules of carbon dioxide. Now, after the carbon dioxide leaves, it's the acetyl-CoA that's going to go into the Krebs cycle to start that process off. All right, so here, here it is. So your pyruvate enters. We strip one carbon off and make carbon dioxide, so we've just oxidized it a little bit. We add coenzyme A to the remaining two carbons to make acetyl coenzyme A, which is a two carbon compound, and we make NADH, which is an electron carrier. So we've just oxidized this pyruvate molecule into this acetyl CoA molecule, and this happens twice one for every pyruvate that was made in glycolysis. <clears throat> so in Krebs cycle, we have a whole lot of intermediates that we're going to go through. The names of those intermediates aren't important. Just like with glycolysis, this is all enzyme controlled. The names of those enzymes aren't important for you to know either. And again, just like with pyruvate oxidation, we're going to do this twice. One for every acetyl coenzyme A molecule that's coming in. So the first thing that happens is we make carbon dioxide. Okay, we make two molecules of carbon dioxide for every turn of this Krebs cycle. Along with carbon dioxide, we also make three molecules of NADH, so one, two, and three, which are, which are our electron carriers. And then we make one molecule of another type of electron carrier called FADH2. So we've made four electron carriers, and then two molecules of carbon dioxide, and then lastly, we make one molecule of ATP. Again, this is happening per turn of the Krebs cycle. All right, so in the Krebs cycle, this is the first time that glucose has been fully oxidized. We only oxidized it halfway in glycolysis. The result of the Krebs cycle is that all of the carbons have been utilized. We've made carbon dioxide from all of the remaining carbons, and there is no more carbons to work from. So in the end, we got two ATP molecules from glycolysis. We got another two ATP molecules from Krebs cycle. So now we have a whopping four ATP molecules. Not really something you want to write home about. Hopefully, this gets better because a human, not well not even human, a living organism cannot run on 4 ATP. So throughout this entire process, I've been telling you how important these electron carriers are. And in class, I kept saying, think of it this way. It's like, you know, your favorite store is having a giant sale in two weeks. So for the two weeks leading up to the sale, you save every penny that you can find because you're going to spend it when you go to the sale. Could you go to the store now and get something for your money? Yeah, you could, but you wouldn't get as much because nothing's on sale. 
If you could wait those two weeks and cash all your money in then, you'll be able to get a lot more things for the same amount of money because things are at a reduced cost. So that's kind of what our electron carriers are. We've been making them continuously through this whole process, and we've been holding on to them for the electron transport chain. So let's go through and figure out what energy we did get from the Krebs cycle. And in this part, we're going to add on Krebs itself with what we got from the um, oxidation of pyruvate. Again, remember it happens twice because we have two pyruvate. So we start off with our pyruvate, which is a three carbon compound. We have two of these. And we're going to end up with six carbon dioxide molecules when we're done. Once we get to this point, glucose has been fully oxidized or pyruvate has been fully oxidized. So along the way, we make four NADH molecules. We make three of these in Krebs, and one comes from the oxidation of pyruvate, and we make one molecule of FADH2. We also make one molecule of ATP. Now because it happens twice, we have eight molecules of NADH, two molecules of FADH2, and two molecules of ATP. That's what we've made between oxidated, the oxidation of pyruvate and the Krebs cycle. So if we're only getting two ATP, why did we go through all of that? Was it even necessary? Yeah, it was, because even though we didn't get a lot of ATP, we got a lot of electron carriers. Again, we're saving up for that big sale. The more electron carriers we can generate, the more benefit it is to us when we get to the electron transport chain. Okay, so now we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty. We're going to talk about the electron transport chain, where you will see the benefit of all of those electron carriers that we've been making. So let's go through from the top all the way down to this point. Glycolysis gave us two ATP. Krebs cycle gave us two ATP. We have four ATP. We know it's not enough. Now we know we have a buttload of electron carriers, but your cell doesn't talk in terms of electron carriers. Like it doesn't account energy in terms of electron carriers. So hopefully these electron carriers are going to be used to make some ATP because that's what your cell recognizes as its er its energy currency. Just to put it in perspective. A muscle that's actually working is going to use about 10 million ATPs per second. And we've just made four. So we already knew it wasn't enough, but now you know exactly how much it's not enough. So there has to be a better way. And there is. That better way is called the electron transport chain. It's a series of proteins that are all built into the membrane, the inner membrane, of the mitochondria. So they're found along those folds, those cristae. And their job is to transport protein and enzymes. Now, these transport proteins are pretty much like the name suggests, they're going to transport electrons. But the movement of electrons creates electricity, it creates a current. So that's linked to the movement of hydrogens as well. The whole process gives you about 36 ATP for one glucose molecule. It can only happen in oxygen, though, so this is definitely an aerobic process. But 36 ATP, now, now we sound like we're doing something. So let's step through and look at exactly how it happens. All right. So if you were to concentrate on this section of your cristae and zoom in, you'd see. This is what the inner membrane looks like. So just to give you some directionality, this is the intermembrane space right here. This blue line represents the outer membrane. Down here we are in the inside, so the matrix region of the mitochondria. And then this is our folded inner membrane. Now, it's a membrane just like your cell membrane, so it's still a lipid bilayer. We're still going to have phosphate heads sticking out. We're still going to have tails sticking in. We have five proteins that are all part of this electron transport chain. Um, you don't necessarily need to know the names, but just to showcase how names are important in biology, look at this first one. It's called NADH dehydrogenase. 
This suggests that this protein is going to take NADH and remove the hydrogen from it. And that's exactly what it does. So, now it's time to break open the piggy bank. We're going to start utilizing all of those electron carriers that we've been making up until this point. So the way the electron transport chain works is, remember, those hydrogen molecules have electrons attached to them. So we're going to take the hydrogens away from the electron carriers, and then we're going to take the electrons away from the hydrogens. The hydrogens will get pumped into the intermembrane space, which will allow us to create a proton gradient, and the electrons get passed from protein to protein to protein, which gives us the energy needed to move those hydrogens. That's the point of the electron transport chain. So NADH comes in and docks at this first protein. This hydrogen gets removed, the electron gets taken off of the hydrogen, and the electron gets passed to the next protein, and then the next, and then the next. While that's happening, the hydrogen that's just been stripped of its electron, which is now an H plus ion, is going to get pumped upward through that protein. The same thing happens to FADH2. It's going to dock on its protein. Its hydrogen is going to get removed. It's going to pass its electron. The hydrogen is going to get pumped up. So the movement of these electrons give these proteins the energy needed to pump hydrogen ions from the matrix into the intermembrane space. This is going to create a gradient, a gradient where we have lots of hydrogens in this area and almost no hydrogens in that area. Natural biological law says that things like G and equilibrium. So these hydrogens are eventually going to start moving until they're evenly spread out. We have a small problem, though. These proteins are one-way pumps. They only pump up. They can't pump back. So unless we find a protein that can pump back, these hydrogens stay here. Again, it's a whole situation of form and function. This is a perfect scenario, because if we could get these hydrogens to move, we could utilize their force, which is called a proton motive force, to create ATP. And that's exactly what your mitochondria does. <clears throat> so like I said, the electrons come in, the hydrogens are stripped off of them or cut off of them, and then the electrons are stripped from the hydrogens, giving us a proton, which is H+. So the protons get pumped into the intermembrane space, and the electrons get passed from protein to protein, creating a flow of electrons, also known as a current or electricity, which gives us the energy to do the work we need to do. All right, so here it is in full detail. Now, we, we, we've gotten up until this point. We know that we have a bunch of hydrogens here. We know that we could use those hydrogens to make ATP if we could just find a way to control their descent back into the matrix. We also know that all of these proteins only pump in one direction. So here enters another protein. This protein is called ATP synthase, and it pumps in the opposite direction from all of these guys. It pumps back into the matrix. So from the intermembrane space into the matrix. But what's going to cause the hydrogens to flow down? Yeah, we know they want to be in equilibrium, but they're probably kind of spreading themselves out here as well. Well, hydrogens, which are positive once they've lost their electrons, are going to be attracted to any element that is electronegative. The most electronegative element we have in a living organism is oxygen. Well, where does the oxygen come from? You breathe it in. Every time you breathe in, you're supplying your cells with fresh oxygen. That oxygen is highly electronegative. It attracts these positive protons, causing them to want to flow through this, um, I'm sorry, to flow through this protein and get back into the matrix. And it's this action that allows us to take ADP and add phosphate to it to make ATP. This process is called oxidative phosphorylation. So here's, what we, here's how we have to think about it. Now, our electrons are flowing downhill. 
which just means that at the very first protein, they have the most energy. And when they get to that last protein, they have the least amount of energy. Okay? The reason that they keep moving from protein to protein to protein is because each protein is slightly more electronegative than the one before. So they're attracted. This is pretty much a controlled event. It's controlled oxidation, which means that we can control how much energy we are receiving. It's that energy that we're going to use to make ATP. So it's similar to burning a piece of firewood through combustion. The difference is it's a controlled process. It's enzyme controlled, which allows us to be more efficient. Instead of making fire, we're making ATP. So that's pretty much it. This is ATP synthase up close and personal. Here are all of our hydrogens. And here's our, well, you, it doesn't show it in this picture, but there's oxygen down here as well. So these hydrogens start flowing through. They're pumped through by ATP synthase, but they're also really attracted to the oxygen that's down here somewhere. And this force drives the coupling of ADP with inorganic phosphate to give us ATP. Now, the diffusion of an ion, like a hydrogen ion, across a membrane is called chemiosmosis. And again, it's just a buildup of hydrogens on one side, and those hydrogens are then going to flow through ATP synthase to make ATP, to build ATP. Here's something you have to remember. The making of ATP and the electron transport chain aren't part of the same process. Chemiosmosis links the two, but electron transport chain's whole purpose is to make this gradient of hydrogens. Once that gradient is created, the electron transport chain is done. It is over. ATP synthesis happens when these hydrogens move through ATP and couple ADP to inorganic phosphate. So, ATP synthesis is not a part of the ETC. It is a separate process. It is the very last step in cellular respiration. All right, so here it is in a nutshell. It shows everything except for glycolysis. So let's, we're going to step through this together. So glycolysis happens in the cytosol. We start off with glucose, and we end up with two three carbon molecules of a substance called pyruvate. In this process, we make two molecules of NADH, and we also make two molecules of ATP. Pyruvate enters the mitochondria, and when it does that, it is going to go through pyruvate oxidation. In pyruvate oxidation, we make two molecules of carbon dioxide, one for every pyruvate. We make two molecules of NADH and two molecules of a new sugar, which is only a two-carbon sugar, excuse me, called acetyl coenzyme A. Acetyl coenzyme A is going to enter the Krebs cycle where the complete oxidation of pyruvate or glucose or acetyl coenzyme, they're all pretty much the same thing, except for some additional carbons here or there, is going to take place. So through two turns of the Krebs cycle, we're going to make four molecules of carbon dioxide, we're going to make two molecules of ATP, we're going to make two molecules of FADH2, and six molecules of NADH. These electron carriers are then going to be transported to the proteins that are embedded in this inner membrane. Once they get there, the hydrogens that they carry will be taken off of them, cleaved or snipped off of them, and the electrons that those hydrogens carry will also be stripped away from the hydrogens. The electrons get passed from protein complex to protein complex because each protein complex is slightly more electronegative than the last one. Electrons start off being very high energy here. By the time they get to this last protein, they've lost most of their energy. That energy is going to be used to move hydrogens and to form ATP at the end. Now, as those electrons move, they produce the energy needed to move hydrogens from the matrix into the intermembrane space, creating a proton gradient. Once that is done, excuse me, um, 
the electron transport chain has, has done its job. Now the oxygen that you breathe in has been brought to the mitochondria. Oxygen, as we know, is the most electronegative element that we have in living bodies. So those hydrogen molecules in the intermembrane space are going to be really attracted to it just because of opposite charges. They're positive and oxygen is negative. So we're going to control their descent through a protein called ATP synthase. As they diffuse through, because they're attracted to this oxygen, they're going to cause the coupling of ADP, which is inorganic phosphate, creating ATP, that cellular respiration. All right, so let's look at where we got our ATPs from. So now we don't really care about the, um, the electron carriers anymore. We're just looking at the actual energy, the actual ATP. So we get two molecules from glycolysis, two more from Krebs cycle, and we can get approximately 36 from the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, which is the, the synthesis of ATP. So total, each section of proteins can give us about 4 ATP. 40 ATP, sorry. Considering that we have lots of these proteins all along these membranes, and every cell has multiple mitochondria, this is how your body gets its energy requirements. All right, so hopefully this was helpful. If you can go through and answer these questions, then you're in, in pretty good shape for knowing and understanding this process. Okay, so this last one, remember I told you that to do this, you have to have oxygen. So what happens if there isn't any oxygen? Well there isn't any oxygen, we still go through and create our proton gradient, but there's nothing to pull those hydrogens through. So <clears throat> eventually, the system will back up. Some of those uh, electron carriers won't be able to get rid of their hydrogens. We're not going to make any ATP. Our cells will run out of energy, and you'll die. And that's why cyanide's poisonous to us, because it blocks the ability of oxygen to make it into your mitochondria. So what was the point? To make ATP. Hope this video was helpful. See you in class. Bye.